Today we talk about baptism for the dead, and that's coming up right now. One of the most amazing things that I have discovered since since coming to Jesus, since abandoning legalism and, and, and religion and that crazy man-made nonsense and just relying strictly on Jesus, the one thing I have come to discover is that the Bible is completely trustworthy. You see, for me, the Bible was always a giant question mark. It was a bunch of individual passages that we used as proof text to support our Mormonism, but I, I never really understood it. What I have come to understand now is that every piece fits together. It, it, it's like this amazing jigsaw puzzle and all the pieces snap together perfectly and they put together a perfect story of Jesus Christ. Uh, I have discovered that his story doesn't change from the Pentateuch to Revelation. It's the same, and I think it's beautiful. Today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to be talking about the idea of baptism for the dead. You see, that's a very powerful notion in Mormonism. The reason that I'm taking a look at this chapter at this particular time is I was speaking with someone who I love very much who was still in Mormonism and she challenged me. She said that I cherry pick, that, that there are pieces of the Bible that I embrace and pieces that I cast away because they don't fit what I want. And, and I said, I, I don't think so. I, I think I embrace the Bible. The entire Bible is the word of God, but please give me an example, I said, show me and, and let me look for myself. She pointed to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29, and it reads, Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead, if the dead are not raised at all? Why are people baptized on their behalf? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 15. And so I told her, you know, I, I don't have an answer for that right now, but I have become so confident in, in the Bible providing all the answers that we need that I told her I would find that answer and I will present it to you. And so that's what I'm doing here today. And so you are welcome to listen in, but this is primarily for that one person who had a specific question. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 opens with Paul bearing a very sure and firm and bold testimony of the deity and the reality of Jesus Christ. He talks about Jesus who uh, was born, lived, died on a cross, was buried and rose on the third day, and then appeared to many, many people, even hundreds at a time. And finally, he said that he appeared last of all to him. He called himself the least of all the witnesses, but he, even Paul was a witness, even though he considered himself the least. He saw the risen God and he bore a firm, a firm testimony of that very fact. After bearing his testimony, Paul turned and he pointed to a specific group of people. You see, in the church at Corinth, there was a group of people. Now, we don't know if that, if that was a large group, if it was uh, a majority of the whole, or if it was just a small, select few. We don't know, but he specifically addressed a group of people who do not believe or did not believe in resurrection. And so this is what he had to say to them. 1 Corinthians 15, 12, he said, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as risen from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? He's very clear about this. There are some of you who are denying that there is resurrection for the dead. And he went on and explained, if, if Christ wasn't resurrected, then we can't be resurrected and there is no resurrection. What's the point of any of this? He was very clear. What do we know about these people that Paul is addressing? We know that they have rejected a very big part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, had, they said there, there's no resurrection. We know that they have limited God's power because if there's no resurrection, then God did not have the power to raise himself from the dead. And if he doesn't have the power to raise himself from the dead, then it follows that he can't raise us. <laughs> you see, they have completely rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power that is his. Paul went on and, and, and he defended that power. He said, 
he, he, he talked of Psalm 1101, the most oft quoted passage in the, uh, from the Old Testament, quoted in the New. He talked about Jesus putting all things under his feet. You see, Jesus has all power and everything is put under his feet. Everything is made in subjection to him. And he talked boldly about that. He talked very, very boldly about that. And he defended the deity of Christ. And so these people who denied Christ, they literally are, are, are creating a new God because they're rejecting the old. If they reject Jesus, they have to reject his gospel. So whatever gospel they have is a new gospel. And clearly they are among those who are defined in Deuteronomy 13, one through five, when it says, if a prophet or dreamer of dreams comes and, and he does all kinds of amazing things, even if he looks like a prophet, he does things that seem very, very, very much like appropriate things for a prophet, even if he, he says things and they come to pass, if he leads you to other gods, then he needs to be put to death, according to, to Deuteronomy. And so here we have a God who can't raise himself and can't raise us. That's another God. And so these people are guilty, according to Deuteronomy. We turn to Galatians 1, starting in verse 6. It says, if we or an angel from heaven should come and lead you to another gospel, a gospel that you have not already received from us, anathema, we must be cursed. And here they are teaching a new gospel, a gospel of a Jesus Christ who has limited powers, not all powers. And so clearly these are among those who are identified in Galatians chapter one. Clearly these are the wolves in sheep's clothing of which Jesus and his apostles clearly spoke. You see, there's no way around this. These people are heretic. These people are, are in blasphemy against God. These people are apostate, having left the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now Paul brings us back to the beginning, verse 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? See, he's asking this question, and what he's saying, if we take that and and, and turn it into more common English, he, he's saying, you claim that the dead cannot be raised, and yet you insist on being baptized for those that can't be helped. Are you nuts? Are you crazy? Are you insane? What's the matter with you? This is Paul's message. And now finally, I will close by turning to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 32 through 34. And it says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Then he warns the people, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right. And do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. It is so clear. He begins with a testimony of Jesus. Then he addresses the people, you do not believe in resurrection. Then he talks to the crazies who are baptizing people that they don't even think can be resurrected. So what is the point? Finally, Paul closes by stringing together a list of condemnations that, that cannot be misunderstood. He talks to these people and he just lays it out. He says, if the dead can't be raised, what's the point? Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. Tells them, you're deceived. Don't be deceived, he says. You are in bad company, and bad company will destroy your good morals, he says. Wake up from your drunken stupor. And finally, he says, you're sinning. You are sinning. You see, it's, it, it's crazy because he strings all these condemnations together, and then finally he says, all of this is to your shame. This speaks condemnation to the Mormon people because they have built an entire doctrine, a, a complex doctrine, on one obscure passage. A passage that asks, what in the world are you doing being baptized for the dead? Joseph Smith misunderstood it, and so he wrote about it in the Doctrine and Covenants. And they use that passage without context, 
without any understanding. If you go to LDS.org, there is a two-sentence paragraph that justifies baptism for the dead. It says, in the days of Paul, some were being baptized for the dead, and then it quotes this passage. No context, no background, no backstory, no understanding, no reading the first part where he condemns them, no reading the final words of Paul when he condemns them. The Mormons are doing the same thing and they will be condemned just as Paul promised against these people. This is crazy. This is strange fire. I'll see you next time.